long time, and I'm so glad she's here and others are here. And today's going to be a wonderful service. And let me tell you something I'm excited about. So I, you've heard me talk about going to a little Baptist church growing up. But when I went to that little Baptist church, the piano player at the church, organist actually, uh, her daughter became one of my best friends. And her daughter was a few years younger than me, maybe four or five years younger than me. And as we grew up, she was a great musician. And she would play. I'd put a quartet together, and I'd either have her play the piano for the quartet or I'd ask her to sing in the quartet. So we were great friends. When Bonita, who sings here often, when Bonita, when we went to Mississippi and Louisiana on a little singing tour, Susan was a part of that group. Anyway, Susan has been in leadership at a couple of great churches in uh, the south part of Atlanta. And she and I have been talking, and she was available today, and I said, would you come and just lead us in music? She is one of my dearest, best friends, and I'm so honored she is here. Would you give a warm village welcome to Susie Coriel? Thank you. Good morning. There we are. Um, I'm just so honored to be here and um, just thankful to have been asked. And I've already met some of you guys. You're so warm and welcoming, and I just appreciate that so much. Um, I would like to say a little bit more about what uh, Ray was talking about. Um, I Do you consider maybe uh, Ray to be the uh, father of the Village Church? It was his, his initial dream and desire to plant this church. Um, well, I might be like your great aunt then, um, because I was literally crawling around on the floors at the first little drugstore in Hell Haven Shopping Center, um, getting the goop up off the floor and helping paint and all that, all that kind of stuff. We go back a long ways, but in fact, a bit longer than that, as he was talking about. So I have a little surprise for him. Um, Derek, if you would go ahead and uh, put the little picture up on the, um, okay, but as he said, I'm a lot younger than he is. That, that's me down in the corner. But this is back when he had hair. <laughs> and we've, we've had a lot of good times together, but I, I am younger than him, not, not quite that much younger. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I'm, I'm just happy to be here to be able to share this morning. And um, this is a throwback song to um, about the second phase of the Village Church, and um, here we go. In a dark, lonely valley of a desert so dry My soul was so thirsty For the water of life With no real direction I was lost as could be But then I met Jesus and Jesus showed me mountains of mercy, oceans of grace, love and forgiveness, taking away the guilt and the shame, and I traded all my the depths of my sin, I was finally forgiven from all I had been, just 
like a prisoner from sin I'm set free is when I met Jesus and Jesus showed me mountains of mercy and oceans of So that was a fun song that we used to do back in, back in the day. But um, listen, worship means so much to me. I mean, there are fun songs, and then there are worship songs. And um, in my life, you know, the Father has just been so good to me. His love that he has poured out on us. Once we get a revelation of that goodness, can we help but love and worship him? And so I feel like worship time is really just a moment in time where we can stop and think deeply about the Father and, and what he has done in our lives, good, his goodness to us. And, you know, I think about my little, I have a four-year-old grandson, starting very young, um, but he zooms around the house, and I just love to watch him. I just love to watch him play. I interact with him a lot, but sometimes I just love to watch him, and it fills my heart with joy. And every once in a while, he'll stop his zooming, and he'll stop saying, Nana, did I go so fast that you couldn't see me that time? You know, I'll stop my lying and say yes. But um, he'll, he'll come up to me and look in my eyes and hug my neck and say, Nana, I love you. I think that that's what we do in worship sometimes. If we're really thinking about the words of the song and, you know, just focusing on um, on the Father, that that's what worship is about. It's just that exchange, that moment that we stop zooming around in our life and focus on who he is and what he's done. And um, just to tell him how much we love him. So I'm going to share a few uh, songs at the um, at the piano. If y'all know them, you know, just join in with me and um, sing. And, and um, I just I thank y'all very much for your, your warmth and your welcome.
friends I'm in trouble he's also a friend when we're not in trouble he wants us to call on him when we need him and he wants us to call on him when we need to love him this is just an old hymn my little take on it but to be called the friend of Jesus is very special to me. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to story. 29 years ago, I was setting out to start the village church, and um, I had located a space, and we had been cleaning madly to make the space okay. We had a little uh, podium about as big as maybe five by five. It wasn't very big at all. A friend of mine made me a little wooden pulpit, and as the day was approaching, I had invited hundreds of people. Um, the shopping center was called Hail Haven, and uh, so anyway, that sounded like hell, kind of, and so I'd use that to try to be funny when I'd invite my friends who didn't go to church, and um, I said to all the, in, my, in the letters that I sent out, I said, Many of you have said that you can't come because the ceiling would cave in if you came to church, but I'm promising you we had an engineer look at the structure, and it's okay for one time. You can come one time. And so uh, anyway, all of this work went into that day, and I did not have a musician. And I was saying to Susie along the way, would you please play? Would you please play? And she was at a stage in her life where she was very nervous, and she said, absolutely not. No, no, I'm not coming. I'm not being a part of it. Just I'll help you clean up a little bit, but I'm not there. And I said, please, if I can't find somebody, please. And she finally begrudgingly said, if you, if you can't find anybody, I'll do it, but I do not want to do it. So I looked, I looked, and I looked, and I looked. And I ended up calling her at 12 o'clock the night before the first service. And I said, will you, 
will you please play? And she said, I knew you were going to do this. She was mad. I mean, she was like really, really, really mad. It's like, I really tried. And so she played that first Sunday, and then I was on my own, and uh, I found a guitar player, Ethan. I don't know if you remember, but he couldn't play. I mean, he just couldn't play. And uh, so I would sing, which was not great, and he couldn't play, and it was horrible. I mean, it was just horrible for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then we finally got somebody to come, and then about a year later, Susan began to play and lead again, and uh, it was wonderful. But that first Sunday, that was crazy. She just, uh, she was nervous and did not want to be a part of that. Hey, now's the time we just pause, as you know, and we just take a few minutes. If you'd like to participate financially, we give you that opportunity. Those who are watching online, you certainly help with your support. So I just want us to have just a moment of silence as the uh, ways to give will be up on the screen. Of course, if you need to give electron electronically, you can do it from your phone. If you need to give with a, a card, you can go to the back. But once you decide how you're going to participate or where you're going to, then just bow your heads and let's spend some time in silence, just for a couple of moments of silence, okay? So if you'd like to participate with giving, now will be the time. It's on the screen. But if you can, now let's bow our heads. Amen. I, I come from a background where we didn't spend a lot of time in silence. And I'm still uncomfortable with it, honestly. Some churches are very, they have learned the beauty of silence. Maybe you have been in one of those churches and they just allow people space to kind of take a breath and to just focus for a moment. And I think those times are precious, and I want to learn how to invite you more and more into those moments of silence. Well, the story that we're going to look at today goes like this. Moses had been on the mountain in God's presence for 40 days and 40 nights. But this wasn't the first time he had been there. No, the first trip on Mount Sinai, you remember he came down with Tablets, precious tablets. The ancient writers said they had been pinned by the very finger of God. But when Moses came down with those precious tablets, he saw all of the people he had left, and they were worshiping a calf, a golden calf. And do you remember what Moses did? In anger, the story says, he breaks the tablets on the ground. Can you imagine what his thought was when he realized God wrote those down? That might have been a good thing to not break. But in the story, he broke those tablets. But this time, this time in the meeting on the mountain, God wasn't writing anything down. Moses, you take notes. And Moses took notes. And Moses brought the new tablets down, the one that Moses wrote, to the people who this time were not worshiping an idol, but they were waiting anxiously to hear from God. I'm reading from Exodus chapter 34, beginning in verse 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hand, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken to the Lord. When Aaron, Moses' brother, and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. Verse 33, when Moses finished speaking to the people, he put a veil over his face. Interesting story. Now I want to go to a New Testament reading, all right? The Apostle Paul picks up that very same story 
and he is going to do something called midrash. Uh, Midrash was what Jewish rabbis did when they would take a scripture from the Old Testament and they would offer commentary on it. It's called Midrash. You'll hear that from time to time. Uh, So this is Paul offering Midrash on the text I just read a moment ago about Moses with his face beaming with the brilliance of his encounter with God and then putting a veil on his face. This is what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14 from the paraphrase, the message. He says, Moses wore a veil so the children of Israel wouldn't notice that the glory was fading away. It was fading away. And they didn't notice. They didn't notice it then, and they don't notice it now. They don't notice that there's nothing left behind the veil. Isn't that a powerful scripture? Paul would continue and say, this is the way of old religion. Paul argues that however glorious its origins, religion, based on laws or rules or codes of conduct, cannot bring a long-lasting brilliance to anyone's life. It may be there for a moment, but it will quickly fade away. To Paul, the glory experienced by Moses, it had faded. But now Paul would say, there is a new way. There is a Jesus way. It is a way better way. And for people who learn to walk in that way, that brilliance doesn't have to ever dim. It's different. It comes from the inside out. And it can shine forever. That way, that spirit of God way, transforms people into vessels overflowing with goodness and love flowing down from the divine. In other words, Paul would say, we can live our lives, we can actually live our lives radiant, beaming, glowing, luminous, incandescent, bright, even brilliant. And the shine in us doesn't have to ever dim. Would you pray with me, please? God, thank you for this day and for this place filled with love and acceptance and beauty and grace. May today be a day for people to discover joy and hope. May today be a day for some to discover the beauty of a chosen spiritual family. May our reading of scripture this morning become a backdrop for a healthy conversation about life that truly shines. Open our minds and our hearts, O God, to understand your heart. Teach us this day your ways in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Since COVID, since we have kind of come back after COVID, Sunday mornings have been kind of, it's been weird for me a little bit. I thank God for those of you who have come, and you've come almost every Sunday. Thank you for that. But it's been like, are people going to come back to church? I know in the suburbs it seems like people have come back, but in in the city, are people going to come back? Are they going to come? Are they going to carve time out to come and sit in a room with other people? when they can watch it on the internet? Is this the old way and it's not going to ever really be the new way? Should I be thinking of a new way that this ought to work? And then with Susie being here today, I've just been thinking about where I came from and where I'm going, and it's kind of been the backdrop for what I want to share with you today. I want to spend a few minutes talking about what I see as fading glory or the fading glory of old-time religion, and the emerging glory that shines, that is available to you and to me when we look at the life that we are invited to embrace, the life of Jesus. And my desire as a pastor is never to have built a big group of people just to have a big group of people. My desire as a pastor is for this to be a place where people come from every walk of life and they experience something that is not 
the old time religion, but something that is beautiful, that beams from within, that never, ever dims. And so with that as the backdrop, I want you to stay with me. Uh, first, I'll give you a little bit of information, kind of how I got here. Had you met me in the 1970s or the 1980s, I would have told you I love the old time religion. I started attending church when I was 13 years old. My mom and dad were having marital issues, and they decided church would help. And unfortunately, or fortunately, however you look at it, mom and dad ended up getting a divorce, so church didn't help that, but it got me in church. And when I got into church, I met teenagers that welcomed me. Um, I never will forget, I'd always been a singer around the house. I had never sung in front of anybody ever, and we had a church homecoming, which was a Sunday where people got up and sang. If they didn't normally sing, they sang that day, and my dad told me that he had signed me up to sing, and I said, what? And he said, I signed you up to sing. I said, no, no young people get up there and sing. That's not, we don't, they don't do that. It's old people that do that. Young people don't do that, and uh, dad said, I signed you up to sing, and I said, they're going to think I'm an idiot, you know, and I was just arguing with him, and he said, I signed you up to sing, you're going to sing, and so I went to Susie's mom's house, Susie's house, and her mom accompanied me, and we practiced a song, and I remember singing, and I thought, this is okay, you know, it said, I got over those jitters and thought, this is okay, they're nice, they're kind, they're helpful to me. I liked the pastor, oh my gosh, Pastor Foster, he'd say funny things, He didn't even know they were funny. He just was country, and he'd say stuff, and it just came out funny, and it was awesome. I loved the music. I loved the music. I liked that I felt secure in my decision to follow Jesus. I liked that I was an insider there. I quickly became an insider. I liked it so much that when I was 16 years old, I believed God wanted me to be a preacher, and he wanted me to take the old-time religion to everybody I met. Had you met me during that era, you might have said, that boy has a certain shine about him, and it did. I went to college and then graduate school, and I pastored three traditional Baptist churches, Southern Baptist churches, and then I started at the interdenominational church you know as The Village, and we will be celebrating our 30th anniversary next May. But over time, yeah, that's good, that's worthy. Over time, what had been a bright light in me began to dim. As I observed church and our culture, it seemed to be more about what you were against than what you were for. I remember thinking, this doesn't feel right. In the paper, I'm always reading about what the church is against. I sensed less and less empathy from people who said they were following the one who had said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It seemed more about believing a set of propositional truths than it was about really walking a vibrant spiritual walk, being on a real journey with God. I began to feel a little like Moses with the veil over my face. It's really hard to stand up in front of people when you feel the light in you has gone out. And over time, I wonder, what am I going to do? Thankfully, some wonderful people crossed my path Some personally, I met them, they became my friends, some just through reading their books. People that you have heard of, Tony and Peggy Campolo, Rob Bell, Brian McLaren, Richard Rohr, a guy named Stan Mitchell, you might have heard of Stan, he'll be here in a couple of weeks. As they spoke about following the path of Jesus, it seemed to resonate Deep inside of me, it seemed so real. It didn't seem old. It didn't seem tired. It didn't seem dead. It seemed robust. It was the turning on of a genuine love light in me. Something was different about it. And I'm so glad that there was a beautiful other way. And I'm so glad that that way allowed me to hang on to my belief in God and my love in Jesus that had captured my heart since I was a young kid, but I saw it through slightly different eyes, and that beaming light that had been in me that had dimmed suddenly was back, and I see that it can last forever. 
What I want to do is I want to spend a few minutes and I want to talk to you about some things I have learned along the journey, the last 15 years especially, about that light that never goes out. And I want that to be the, the, the message of our church. Come to the village and discover that light that shines in you that never has to go out. Find out what things are so special that Jesus said, follow me, and if you follow him, these things can be true for you. First thing I'd say is this, a religion that focuses on just believing the right stuff, you lose your radiance if that's the focus. Light from within, it comes when following Jesus really becomes what it's all about. It becomes a following Jesus kind of life. I've talked about this person before. It's a person who used to go to our church, good person, wanted to help people, but she believed that everybody ought to have a certain belief about the Trinity. If you had this belief about the Trinity, you were good. If you did not believe the Trinity the way she understood the Trinity, then you were not good. And so this was her clarion call. It was always about making sure 13-year-old girls understood the Trinity. And I would try to say, I don't think it's about that. You know, early church leaders, after Christ was resurrected, it took them 300 years before they even began to articulate what the Trinity might be. That wasn't a thought in the first century after Christ or the second century after Christ. Third century after Christ, they, they would have these councils where people would come from all over the known world and they would discuss or debate these religious ideas and then they would formulate what was going to be the, the opinion and they would write a creed and it would be the creed from that council and that would be one little piece of, of theology. The most famous council was in Nicaea in 325. It was to resolve the controversy of Arianism, which was a doctrine that held that Christ was divine but was not a created being. This council was called by the Roman Emperor Constantine. Then there was the Council of Constantinople in 381. That extended the discussion of the identification of the Holy Spirit as part of the Godhead. Then there was the Council of Chalcedon, AD 451, which, which focused on the relationship of Christ's humanity to his divinity, which was known as a hypostatic union, and issued the formula of Chalcedon, which became the orthodox statement of the person of Christ, he is fully God and fully human. Those things took hundreds of years for people to wrestle with, to come up with a way to say it, and here we are in the church saying what matters most is that you believe the right thing. For 400 years, it wasn't about believing the right thing. It was about following the path of Jesus. But we had made it something else. Robin Myers wrote an interesting book called Saving God from Religion, A Minister's Search for Faith in a Skeptical Age. This is what he wrote. Consider this remarkable fact. In the Sermon on the Mount, there is not a single word about what to believe, only words about what to do and how to be. By the time the Nicene Creed is written, only three centuries later, 325 Common Era, there's not a single word in it about what to do and how to be. There are only words in it about what to believe. So that's why people can say, I'm a Christian. Why? Uh, I believe in Jesus. That's not what it is. But being a Christian is that you have really said, I want to follow the way of Jesus. I want to follow his way. But we have made it into something it's not. I remember growing up, you had to believe, and the way you came to belief is in something called the Romans Road. You know what we did? We took one verse from Romans chapter 3. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We took one verse from Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. We took two verses from Romans 10. If thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then another verse, I can't remember what it was. But I was sure impressed I remembered that far. But we thought it was about belief. And if you said, I believe it, you're in. You're in. That's all it takes. You're in. But it was never about that. I remember arguing about baptism by immersion. 
Like, I knew that Jesus was baptized by John by immersion. I knew that. I knew that Jesus baptized by immersion, right? I knew this was a part of the deal. Why? I went to seminary, Baptist seminary, Baptist, big deal about baptizing. That's where we come from. You know, that idea that we immerse. Baptizo in the Greek is the word. It means to dip. It's, a, it's used for cloth, being dipped into dye. That's what it means to baptizo, to dip. So I had that figured out. And I would argue with people about that because you had to believe that. But there were people who were parts of churches that just put water here. I would, I would also say, but this doesn't have anything to do with salvation. Of course, this is just something that's just a testimony of you being a follower of Jesus. So then people would sprinkle, right? And I'd say, well, that's wrong. Why are you doing that? Well, it's just a testimony, just letting people know they're a follower of Jesus, right? We, we're not filling a tank. We're just use this. But it was about what you believed, not about what you did or who you were or how you learned to be. We knew who was going to heaven and who was not. We knew who was in and who was out. What made the difference? What they believed. That was it. Say the prayer, you're in. I knew how the world was going to end. I knew exactly how it was going to end. I knew about the creation. I knew it was 6,000 years ago. I had a literal interpretation of the creation story. The idea that it could have perhaps been a Jewish poem that was a metaphor that was never intended to be a scientific document, that never crossed my mind. But I believed the right stuff. And over time... There was no joy in always looking around for people who believed differently than me so I could make sure they were in the outside class and the people who believed exactly like me were in the inside class. And that's what Christianity in many places has become. We just cluster together with people who think exactly like us. To hell with people who are different, who believe different, who maybe have a different understanding. They're of the devil. We're of God. So what happened to me over time was I began to feel more connected with people who did not share our common belief. This was a strange thing. I began to feel connected, Tyler, to people who didn't come from that little place I came from who had a totally different understanding of it, but they cared for the poor. They cared for those who were being bullied. They would take a stand for those who were being uh, marginalized in any way, and they didn't claim to believe the same things that I believed, but there was something about them that I resonated with when the people who had the beliefs that I thought were the right beliefs, I didn't resonate with them at all. I didn't resonate or vibrate with the person who says they believe in the same God I do, but had no interest in helping people. Cory Booker, senator from New Jersey, I've always liked this statement. He says, he says, I'll take an atheist who serves over a person who prays to God preaches of God, celebrates God, but fails to serve mankind. I will too. I will too. Because all of those things about God, the only way you can do any of that is if you are doing it to help mankind. It's not like you're throwing money to God in the air. The only way you can do any of that, the only way you can show love to God is by showing love to humanity. That's the only way it works. Who is it? Who walks in love? Is it the person who has right beliefs? Well, Jesus said salt of the earth. You're to be salt of the earth, light of the world. 1 John 4, 16 says this, God is love. God is love, and whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. Why don't we ever say that? When we see somebody loving who has a different belief than us, why don't we ever say, Whoever lives in love lives in God. God lives in them. We never say that. It's like, did you pray the prayer that I prayed? Because that's the entryway, even though Jesus never said that. Never. We just go through every verse. He never did that. Never prayed the sinner's prayer, all of that stuff. That was never part of his deal. Second thing I want to say is this. Fear-based religion ultimately, ultimately leads to darkness. I loved you picked those songs you picked, Susie. I thought they were spot on. I am no longer a slave for fear. That's a, that's a great song. 
Light from within comes when we understand we are accepted and we are loved by God. Y'all, it starts with that. You're accepted and you're loved by God. Not that you're a sinner, hell-bound. No, you're accepted and loved by God. God has always loved you. There's never been one second. And there's never been one second that you've been separated from God. Hear me. If God is omnipotent, and God is everywhere, does he not reside in every human heart? They may not know. He may be pushed to corners. There may not be the freedom for God to do God's thing. But there is no place you can go where God is not there. And that means even the deepest depths of your heart. Well, my path was a fear path. I was scared to death of God. And then I was scared to death of my own death. I thought about it all the time. And then I prayed the prayer at church, and that made me not have that fear of my death anymore. But then I was fearful for my friends. I wanted to make sure all my friends prayed the same prayer that I prayed so they would not be afraid the way I had been afraid of the possibilities of death. So I was pretty good at inviting people to church because I was driven by fear. Then I become a preacher, and this is not an exaggeration. I would stay up all Saturday night worried sick that maybe I wouldn't say it exactly right. Maybe I wouldn't present the message in the clearest way. Maybe somebody would come and it would be their only opportunity, but old Ray messes it up and they go out far from God, never find the answer and end up spending eternity separated from God. I struggled with that most of my early life. Fear, fear. But then it began to click differently for me. This is not on the screen, but you hear me. 1 John 4.18 says this, there is no fear in love. Would you just say that with me? There is no fear in love. Would you say it again with me, please? There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is is not made perfect in love. God is love. Perfect love casts out fear. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. God looks like what you see in me. Jesus said, this is what you do when someone hurts you. You forgive them. Now, why would Jesus say for us to forgive people who hurt us and then us to preach a message that God doesn't forgive people who hurt us? God. That that began to not make sense to me. If Jesus is the face of God, it didn't make sense. Jesus said, you never return evil with evil. No, you return evil with good. Why would God return evil with more evil? It didn't make sense to me. Whenever I even tried to preach that, the light was gone. It was, keep the veil over my face because I am not believing this. But then I began to think about the love of God. And the veil could come down because I believed with everything in me that if God is Trinity and Jesus is the face of God, then the universe is benevolent and God is always on our side. God loves us. God pulls for us. God wants us. He pulls us into a better future. God is always there. I was on a podcast a few years ago. A young man doing the podcast said, well, aren't you afraid of hell? And I said, if by that you mean a burning fire where the majority of people from all history go, where they will burn for eternity, I don't mean for this to sound arrogant, but I cannot see God that way. If you believe that, then when the Jews went from the Holocaust where they were burned up by Hitler, they left those burning fires only to go into eternal fires by God. I can preach it, but I got to wear a veil because I don't believe it. 
I believe that God is love. Love cast out fear. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. Here's another learning. A fading religion is one that makes the main thing following some type of a behavior code. The inner shine, it comes when we make a difference in the world with our lives. The Jewish leaders of the day, when Jesus was on the earth, they made it all about codes. Eat kosher, pay your tithes, offer your sacrifices. Last night, a couple came to our house, and they brought meat for me to cook on the grill and a bottle of wine. And I had done their wedding during COVID for like 15 people in our backyard, and now they're doing a wedding where they'll have more people and it'll be up in the mountains. So that's what we were talking about. But they brought the meat. I was going to cook it on the grill. And uh, she's Jewish. And uh, we were telling her about, Jane and I were telling her about our Orthodox Jewish friends and how we could never bring any food to their house because they're Orthodox. And it's like, no, if it's not kosher, you can't, bring, please don't bring anything. We'll have the food. We'll cover the food. Don't touch anything because you're Gentile. So that's fine. So she was saying to us, I, I'm not Orthodox. And I said, you know what gave that away? And she said, what? I said, you brought pork chops for me to cook. You would not have brought pork chops had you been orthodox. That would have been the craziest thing in the world. It's not about a behavior code. It's not about following rules of dietary. That's not what it's about. Jesus' words were, and you have heard me say it, lek hakarai. Come follow me. Come and follow me. Follow me. He taught them that God's kingdom was here, right now. This is God's kingdom. It is not, hey, pray a prayer so one day you can go to God's kingdom in the sky. No, it is you are invited to walk this very minute in the kingdom of God where you see everything differently. You see it through divine eyes. You see it the way it can be. You're pulled into something more wonderful than you had ever dreamed. Follow me, Jesus said. And Jesus teachings, God's kingdom, things were done differently. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, Jesus' first sermon, quoting the Old Testament, Jesus said this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus was saying, we're going to shake things up here. Because we're going to see things through eternity eyes, through kingdom eyes, through divine eyes. You see him meeting with a Samaritan woman. Nobody would have met with a Samaritan woman. Jesus did. You hear him tell a story where the punchline is the one person who did it right, and Jesus used an ethnic group that was the most hated of the day. He said it was a good Samaritan that helped the person on the road. And the Jews, their mouths were wide open. What did he just say? Watch him love and hang out with people who were social outcasts, the drunkards, the prostitutes, the tax collectors. He challenged unjust behavior. He confronted the spiritually arrogant. You want to hear Jesus say harsh things? Woe to you Pharisees and you scribes. You who teach such a hard lesson trying to convert people to something that you believe so they can be twice the children of hell that you are. He was tough. He reordered the political world. He advocated for the poor. His life's mission was to release the oppressed. This is the test, he would say. Whatever you would like done to you, you do it unto others. You love your neighbors yourself. And then in Matthew 25, he said the litmus test of worthwhile religion would be how people respond to those in need. You remember this. This ought to be on all of our bathroom mirrors or at least our refrigerator, Jesus says in a parable, I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will say, Lord, when did we see you in all these places? And Jesus said, when you have done it unto the least of these, you have done it to me. You want to know how you can be in a God encounter? 
you reach out your hand in some way to someone who is struggling, who is a part of a class of people who has been marginalized or low, uh, someone in prison, for example, somebody who has it bad, you reach out your hand to them, and I guarantee Jesus is in the mix of that encounter. When you've done it under the least of these, Jesus says, you've done it to me. The early church understood that. Early Christians, they were activists. They really tried to help people. They cared for the poor and the sick. There would, be, there would be viruses that would sweep the ancient world where people were dead on the streets, but it was Christians who would take in the sick. When everyone else was running from the people who had the plagues, it was Christians who said, we will take care of you. Well, this may kill you too. That's all right. Our job is to take care of those who are hurting. They cared for the poor. They cared for the sick. They rescued children who were in bad situations. They were known for their compassion and their kindness. A little church history maybe you'd like to know. In the latter part of the 19th and early parts of the 20th century, there were, tw there were churches all across America that saw themselves fighting for the underdog. These churches, they fought for equal rights for African Americans. They fought for equal rights for women but inside the American church, there was another group of people that rose up and said, those people are for social justice, and that's bad. We are just for getting people saved, and that's good. Jesus said, I've come to deliver the captive. I've come to set the prisoner free. I've come to make the world right where it's been wrong." But now you have a religion here saying we're for saved, getting people saved. And they say this group is only about preaching the social gospel or being a part of liberating the people or, or social justice. Uh, Marshall posted something this morning I loved. He said those who say, what is social justice anyway? It sounds to him the same ring as the person who said to Jesus, and who is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? Well, that group over here, they were called fundamentalists. They later became known as evangelicals. It was all about getting people saved. That's all it was, getting people saved. Not about following the path of Jesus, fighting for the underdog. It was getting people saved. The thought of fighting for people who were marginalized was not on my radar most of my life. It certainly wasn't on my radar. But then it began to resonate more with me that if I'm on the Jesus path, then I should care for the poor. I mean, the, the poor, the poor. There are over 2,000 verses of Scripture that call upon us to respond to the needs of the poor. There's more verses about responding to the poor than almost any topic in all the Bible. But I would argue about these other topics that I knew, the belief topics, and not think about helping the poor. Crazy how that works. Father Gregory Boyle says this, compassion starts when we stand in awe at what the poor have to carry rather than in judgment at how they carry it. Jane and I tell everybody we see, watch Made on Netflix. It is the truest thing I have seen. about Because everybody's got a story of somebody that's poor, who has taken advantage of people and who's not willing to work and all that stuff. And there are examples of that. Just like there are examples of rich people taking advantage of tax codes. And, you know, there's advantages. I mean, there's, there's, you can find those examples for sure, but there's a lot of good rich people and there's a lot of really good poor people who are trying with everything they have. And they just need somebody to give them a hand up. They just need somebody to help them because if their car breaks down, they don't have a support system and they can't do anything and now they're so far behind they can't get out of debt. What are they going to do? We had a girl who went to school with me, and she has, um, her car has stopped working. She's almost 60 years old. She lives way far away in, a, not Bowden, but way, way far away, and she's stuck. She has disability. She can't go anywhere. She has no support system. So I called a few friends and said, well, y'all kick in some money. We, we need to help this girl. So some friends kicked in some money. We came up with $2,500. You know what I found out about $2,500? It will not buy a, used, a good used car today unless you guys know something 
and, and know, have an inside somewhere. I can't even find a good car at an auction for $2,500. What do you do when you're poor? You don't have transportation. You don't have any way to make it. What do you do? So now we're going back to the drawing board. We're going to try to raise some more, try to figure out how do you help somebody poor? How do you help them? The thought of fighting for people who are marginalized was not on my radar, but now it is. I love that that group of Christians back at the turn of the 1900s, I love that they were fighting for women's rights. You know what? Women have rights. Now they're, I mean, we say equal in every way. For sure, I believe that. But I can't tell you the number of women who have told me when they sit in meetings, they're not heard. Y'all know what I'm talking about? They're saying stuff and the men are talking over them as if they really don't have anything to say. I believe as followers of Jesus, we fight for women and say, you are you are at the table. This is your table just as much as any of our tables. You, every leadership gift you have, it is honored by us. God made you equal in Christ. The Bible says there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male or female. We are all equal in God. We believe you should fight for the immigrant. It's what Jesus said, the person bullied or locked out of church because of sexual orientation, gender identity, whatever it is, we fight for them. This all took me back to the lessons I learned from my dad, which is you fight for the underdog. That's the only kind of fight that he said I, he, he would let me, didn't mind me getting into. As long as you're fighting for the underdog. I put quotes up there on the board of smart people who say smart things. This is a Ray Waters quote. If you find it on the internet said by somebody else, they got this from me, all right? You are never more like God than when you stand up for the underdog and identify with and help alleviate suffering for the poor. That's when you are like God. That's when you are like Christ. That's when you are the most like the divine. Well, I'm taking too long. Jeez, I'm taking too long. Um, let me just quickly say, I want our church to be a church where we glow. And I believe we'll do that when we do what Susie said just a little while ago, when we learn to worship God with all of our heart, open ourselves up to God fully, and then we realize it is not about right belief. It is not about right belief. It is about following the path of Jesus. And I believe that that message is still so needed. And I believe there needs to be a village church. And I believe this place needs to be filled with people who need to hear the loving message of God who cares for them and wants the best for them and wants them to learn to walk in this healthy life, a life of genuine concern and love for others. I believe it's going to happen. I believe you're going to help make it happen here because you are going to get excited about what is happening in this place. We're going to begin to do some things that we've done in the past. I'm going to ask Jessica if she'll do a book club. I want to start a book club of some type. Jane wants to start the women's ministry back. We want to get some things going because this place needs to be filled with people who need to hear the message of a light that never has to go dim. You with me? Let's pray. God, let's applaud. That's a better way to end. Let's applaud. God, help us take this message to the streets. Help us share the love of God with everyone we meet. Thank you for this good day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Y'all say hello to Susie if you haven't met her yet. You're dismissed, everybody.